minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire! <laughs> This is NASA testing their new moon rocket, the Space Launch System, that will take humans to the surface of the moon in just a few years. SLS is going to do more than Apollo did all those years ago. Instead of just planting a flag and taking samples, NASA wants to have a sustained presence in the long term. A moon base is the sci-fi future that we've all been dreaming of, and soon it will be a reality. Once complete, the SLS will be one of the most powerful rockets ever built creating over 3,900 metric tons of thrust. But if you look online, you'll probably find a good amount of criticism for this new rocket. In this video, we will look at why this rocket was first created, the current state of the program, and what the future might look like. And hopefully by the end of the video, we'll see if the criticisms hold any water. My name is Zach, and I wanna thank you for checking out my channel. Please subscribe and like the video if you enjoy it. Let's get right back into it. NASA is stacking the first full SLS rocket down at the Kennedy Space Center as we speak. So what better time to make a video about it? Let's start by looking at the design of the SLS. There are multiple versions of the rocket planned, some for crew and some for cargo. Over time, there's gonna be upgrades to the performance of the rocket. Each design change is called a block. These block upgrades will roll out over the next eight years and give SLS a good size boost in performance. This ends up being about an 8% increase in total thrust and a 38% increase in payload capacity from the first version to the final version of SLS. Pause the video if you want to take a closer look because we are going to focus on the first crewed version of the rocket. The core stage will be powered by four RS-25 engines built by Aerojet Rocketdyne, the same engines used on the space shuttle. The first four flights will actually use leftover engines from the shuttle program before they switch to a simplified version. These engines use liquid hydrogen and oxygen as propellants and generate 189 metric tons of thrust each. The first stage also has two solid rocket boosters carried over from the shuttle program that generate the majority of the thrust at liftoff. Each one generates 1,632 metric tons of thrust, making the total 3,992 tons for the core stage. The second stage is simply named the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. It uses an RL-10B2 engine and runs on liquid hydrogen and oxygen, just like the core stage. It's actually a modified version of the Delta cryogenic second stage that's used on the Delta IV Heavy. Finally, we have the Orion spacecraft sitting on top of the whole rocket. It's designed to take astronauts to deep space, but first, the target is the moon. It's made up of three parts, a crew module, the European service module, and on the very top of the stack, there is a launch escape tower that can pull the spacecraft away from the rocket in case of an emergency. Going back to the other blocks, the first major upgrade will be the change in second stage. Block 1B will start using the exploration upper stage. It's a higher performance second stage made specifically for SLS. For block two, the SRBs will receive a much needed upgrade, which increases the payload to low earth orbit from 95 tons to 130 tons. Later in the video, we'll go over some more stats and compare it to other rockets in its class. But first, let's look back at why NASA and Congress decided to create this giant rocket in the first place. Let's take a trip back in time to the early 2000s. President George Bush was in office, and after the Columbia disaster, the state of spaceflight wasn't really looking great. So the president released his plan for the future of NASA called the Vision for Space Exploration, which led to the creation of the Constellation Program. The goals were to have sustained human presence on the moon and a stepping stone to future exploration of Mars and other destinations. The basic idea was to start by sending astronauts to the space station, then to the moon, and eventually to Mars and beyond. The goal was great, and that's what we should have been aiming for, but it was executed poorly, severely behind schedule and over budget. There was a review of the Constellation program by the Augustine Commission in 2009. It really dealt the final death blow to the program, and it was quickly canceled. This included the Orion capsule, but it would be brought back from the dead and repurposed to launch on SLS. Anyway, the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 is where SLS really began. 
Once funding was allocated, development started, and NASA used a lot of the same hardware and contractors from the soon to be canceled space shuttle. The overall goal was more or less the same, taking humans to the moon and later to Mars. So it was really almost like a hit of the refresh button, but still carried over a lot from the previous programs. Next, let's take a look at how SLS compares to other super heavy launch vehicles. First, I just want to look at the stats for the Block 1 version of the SLS itself. It's 91.8 meters tall with a core diameter of 8.4 meters. It's a two-stage design using two strap-on solid rocket boosters. The first stage generates 3,992 metric tons of thrust, can bring 95 tons of cargo to low Earth orbit, or send just over 27 tons on a lunar injection. You should see the first flight no earlier than December 2021, and the estimated launch costs are over $2 billion apiece. Let's add in the stats for the fully upgraded crew version of SLS. I won't read each out, but most notably, payload to lunar injection increases to 43 plus tons for the crewed version. Of course, we need to also cover the Saturn V. It was 110.6 meters tall with a max diameter of 10.1 meters. It was a three-stage design using RP-1 and liquid oxygen in the first stage, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen in the second and third stages. Generated 3,579 metric tons of thrust. It could bring 140 tons to low Earth orbit or send 48.6 tons on a lunar injection and the launch costs were around $1.23 billion adjusted for inflation. The last one we're gonna cover is the SpaceX Starship, which will come online alongside the SLS, but keep in mind that this vehicle is fully reusable, making the economics drastically different and harder to compare. It will be around 120 meters tall with a diameter of nine meters. It's a two-stage design using liquid methane and liquid oxygen as the propellants, it generates around 7,300 metric tons of thrust, much more than any other rocket ever built. It can bring somewhere between 100 and 150 tons to low Earth orbit, depending on the configuration. With this system, it's designed to refuel once in orbit, making it hard to compare to the other rockets, but once refueled, it can take its entire 100 to 150 tons of payload to the moon or Mars. Its first full launch should be sometime within the next few months, barring any additional delays. And finally, SpaceX are hoping to get launch costs down to $2 million. That's a goal and it's aspirational, but again, this is hard to compare because it's a fully reusable rocket. Now let's move on to looking at the current state of SLS. As I speak, SLS is being stacked for its first flight, which is planned to launch right around the end of the year, late in December 2021. NASA also completed several tests, including firing the core stage in a test called the Green Run, and in a separate test, they fired the solid rocket boosters. To get astronauts to the surface from lunar orbit, NASA awarded SpaceX a contract for a lander and is currently looking into another contract for a long-term sustainable solution. SpaceX will be using a lunar variant of the Starship for the initial moon landings, beating out the national team and Dynetics for the contract. This has led to a number of protests and lawsuits, mainly from Blue Origin because NASA originally wanted to select two landers, but only had the funding for one. A few SLS launches are already planned, the first being an uncrewed test that we already spoke about at the end of 2021. The second is a crewed flyby of the moon launching no earlier than September 2023. And the third is the first moon landing of the program, launching no earlier than October 2024. It really seems like progress is being made lately and I'm super excited to finally see SLS launch. But we have to take a look at some of the dirty laundry as well. There have been quite a few delays and increases in budget since the program was created. And with this comes a lot of the critics that believe the program should have been canceled. If we look at the total funding allocated over the years, over $20 billion has been spent on the rocket itself and around the same has been spent on the Orion spacecraft. No doubt this is a huge amount of money, especially compared to privately developed rockets and spacecraft. But if we look back to the Constellation program that SLS replaced, it was estimated to end up costing around $150 billion. In reality though, the cost would have ended up being even greater. So in that sense, SLS has has been more cost effective, but it's still far from the efficiency of privately developed rockets. With all of this in mind, I wanna answer the question, is SLS still required to return to the moon? 
I think the answer to this question is complicated and really depends on the future of rockets that aren't yet operational. Maybe in the long term, if and when commercial options prove to be successful and cheaper, then we can have a serious conversation on if SLS spending should continue. We don't want to fall victim to the sunk cost fallacy, but at the same time, we can't keep starting over and over again. Back in 2010, NASA had no other reasonable option besides developing their own rocket. Commercial crew wasn't anywhere near operational, and no private company was able to fly astronauts. So that route was riskier than an in-house solution. But one thing is clear, SLS should and most likely will be NASA's last in-house rocket. Buying launches from the commercial market is so much more cost effective. Circumstances could always change, of course, but NASA has always been the best at focusing on the cutting edge technologies and science that isn't profitable for private companies to develop. And we've crossed that point where these companies are better at building rockets and launching passengers. Getting back to the question though, we have invested so much money and are on the verge of finally launching the first SLS rocket. So canceling the project in the near future would be irresponsible. On the other hand, once alternatives are operational and proven, I hope NASA sees the writing on the wall and embraces the commercial market for launch services past low Earth orbit. So the focus should be on helping private companies to achieve this goal instead. One good way to view SLS is an inefficient means to achieve the ideal goal. It's an interesting time in the history of NASA where day by day, it's becoming clear that private companies can build better and cheaper launch vehicles. So there's a very good chance this will be the last time we see NASA building their own rockets. We need to be able to pivot to a much cheaper commercial provider when alternatives become available. Keeping SLS past this point could end with the program meeting a similar fate to the Apollo program where continued costs and changing leadership caused the program to be canceled. When Apollo was canceled, human spaceflight was set back so far and it took 50 years to get back to where we once were. And I really hope we don't see history repeat itself. And the way to prevent this is to place the capabilities in the hands of the private sector. That is my opinion at least. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like, comment, subscribe. I hope everyone stays safe, stay healthy, stay happy. I'll see everyone soon. Peace.